We'll just give it a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. All right, so uh, I don't want to keep this delayed any longer, so we'll probably have a few more people join as we start, as it tends to happen, but uh, we'll go ahead and get going now. Um, looks like we have pretty close to the, the amount of registered, yeah, the amount of attendees that we had registered, so that's pretty good. Um, so uh, obviously if you can hear me, you can hear me, so I'm not going to tell you alternate methods. Uh, if you do have any problems with audio, if it boots you off repeatedly or anything, you might try using the phone audio audio instead of the built-in computer audio, that can be a little more reliable sometimes, just depending on what your local IT infrastructure looks like. So, um, I will be, as we go along here, uh, trying to keep an eye on the chat box um, for questions people might have typed in. Um, I'm not perfect at that, so uh, I may have to go back occasionally and double check. Um, you may also, of course, chime in with questions you might have uh, via your phone or, or other audio. If you're not currently asking questions, though, I'd ask that you go ahead and mute your phone or mute the audio on your end um, so we don't end up with random background noise, people talking or, or people in the hall or cars or whatever. Um, I'd appreciate that. Um, I can force mute people, but then you don't have a way to talk to me, so I try to avoid doing that. Um, okay, so today's session, uh, hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, is called What About the Records? And we will be talking about um, how we manage uh, r records, electronic records particularly, um, in different types of information systems that we may have. I'm going to get my thing clipped right here. So, first of all, uh, who, who am I? Who's talking to you? So, uh, my name's Christopher Stenson. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of me or met me before, um, I work for the Oregon State Archives. My role here is as the administrator of our statewide electronic records management system, um, or ORMS, the Oregon Records Management Solution. Uh, that's not necessarily what we're talking about today, but that's that's my main role here. Um, I also do uh, I also do a lot of these sort of sessions, educational and outreach sessions. So, um, so this is a this is one that I debuted back in October, and this will be the third time we've done it. So, or I guess the second time for the state alone, we did it for a, a national audience once as well. So, okay, so. This is kind of, uh, I want to outline sort of where the environment we find ourselves in and why, why this presentation in particular actually has some importance. Um, so we find that records live in many different types of information systems. Um, they don't live in one place alone. Uh, it's, not a mat it's not a situation where, like in a paper world, we're keeping everything in file cabinets. Um, we're keeping things, uh, electronic records, we're keeping them in email systems. We're keeping them in proprietary databases. We're keeping them in offline storage. We're keeping them in uh, on shared drive, excuse me, shared drives or sometimes local drives. Um, they exist all over the place. Excuse me, they exist in the cloud and various storage providers we may have. All of which can provide challenges since many of these systems are not necessarily designed with longevity and stability of records at the as the primary influence. Um, so these systems aren't necessarily designed for or intended for long-term record storage. Um, unlike an electronic records management system, which I will mention later, which is a type of software that is specifically designed to manage records, um, a lot of these other things, think your finance systems, uh, uh, building code systems, permitting systems, uh, HR payroll systems, 
um, and he works with student records or medical records, those sort of things, all have sort of specialized software niches that contain records but aren't necessarily designed as a long-term repository. Um, often what we found traditionally is that decisions about procuring or maintaining or adapting information systems is typically driven by budget and other administrative needs, not records management concerns. We don't tend to think about records management until it's time to do something with the records, which, um, as I'm going to sort of show, is often a little bit too late. So uh, this is sort of the environment we find ourselves in. So the first section, we're going to talk a couple different sections. First one, I'm going to talk about questions and answers, or questions mostly, we should be asking when we are looking at developing a new software system or purchasing one. And this could be any type of those systems I mentioned, you know, any sort of new information system uh, which may be used uh, in the course of business, in the course of public work particularly. So the first question, this is going to be a sequence of questions that we'll sort of seek to lay out, the sort of questions that you should be asking um, before you jump into any decision regarding software. Um, so first thing we want to ask is what records will reside in the system? Of course, we need to know what's going to be in there so we can make an informed decision about how we should treat it. Um, will the software be used to store and access records? Uh, so will this be our primary storage environment? This is, is this where we are going to be going for records or is it simply a pass-through system? Is it a, a web portal where people interact with but actually goes somewhere else? So we do have to think about the records management implications, and we need to make sure we are checking our uh, local rules uh, and laws regarding what you are allowed to do. So specifically, um, in the Oregon Administrative Rules, one, Section 166, which is the section for the archives, under Division 17, which was uh, revised heavily in 2015, um, that, excuse me, in 2016, in 2016 we revised it heavily, um, and in that are requirements for systems that are going to maintain records, particularly those that are permanent or near permanent. So records of 100 or your, excuse me, 100 or more year retention. There are requirements regarding the sort of software that has to be used. Um, I'm not going to recite these things for you in this presentation, but I'm just sort of laying out where you should be looking. Um, second question. So once we've identified uh, that records will be stored in there, how long will they be kept in the system? Because this is another thing that may dictate your decision. So can the system, in fact, meet the full retention requirements of the records that are going to be stored in there? So um, if we are dealing with a system that handles mainly, um, say, short-term payroll records, which are you know six years for most of them, six years past the year in which they were generated, um, those are relatively short-term, and the system can probably maintain them for that period of time. Uh, safely enough. You know, we aren't really concerned about long-term access. Uh, this is purely a short-term system. So that would be an example of, uh, we could say, yeah, this system will be designed to do that. We're good there. Um, however, if, uh, if that system cannot meet those full retention requirements, how are we going to export records uh, and the metadata surrounding them, so the information we've gathered around them, the notes, uh, any sort of contextual information we've attached to those records, how can we export that so we can store it elsewhere? So again, this is something that you always want to be asking a potential vendor or a developer before the software is decided. You need to be looking at them going, okay, we need to, uh, we need to make sure we're answering these questions and we don't lock things up. Um, what's the capacity for storage in the system is the next question. Uh, because while many things are designed with a sort of a fixed universe and they say, oh, we can expand upon this, well, how much? Because uh, you can, in some types of uh, information systems tack on extra storage on the back end, but at a certain point you may see performance degradation. So the software, the database overlaying that storage can only handle so much, for example, until it starts to bog down. So these are limits you want to know ahead of time. You want to know what the theoretical or practical limits of a system are and then look at what we're keeping in there so you can identify, you know, when are we going to hit that? Are we going to hit that maximum in the projected life of the system? Or are we expecting, you know, we'd have to be using it for 20 odd years for us to hit that and we're not going to use it for that long probably, that sort of thing. So that's the question to ask. Um, I want to make sure over retention of too much content in there can definitely uh, uh, detrimentally affect how systems perform. It's not just a matter of adding more storage. So the next big question beyond storage is how will I access the records in this system? So we do need to think about how records will be searched and used. Um, so you need to think about aspects of how do my employees, how do the people working in the system need to access information? Um, how will they provide access to other parties? Do I need to be able to share with external users somehow? Is that something built in or are we going to be pulling copies out constantly? Is there some sort of interface with another system we should consider? 
Um, are you going to be able to search across content, or are just are you just going to browse for your records like you'd think of in a normal uh, directory structure? So if you think about a shared drive, or or you're in your own computer drive where you have folders and then folders within those, and you can browse down, but the searchability is pretty pretty flat on that. Um, that can work okay if you know exactly where your th stuff is stored and it's well organized and you don't have too much of it. But if you are going to be storing, uh, you know, many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of records in a system, uh, browsing is not a practical approach. You have to be able to search. And for that, you need to be making sure what are the cap capabilities? Or am I going to be able to search across content? Or is it only going to search certain keyword fields? Um, do I have to apply that information at the beginning, et cetera? Um, so going along with this, will you be able to contain all of the information you need to find the records later in the system? So um, any computer system is only good as good as the implementation. So if you dump a bunch of undifferentiated junk into any sort of system, uh, that's what you're going to have in there. So you know, software is not magic. Um, you know, depending, it may be able to glean some information to search across in there. But generally speaking, if you have poorly indexed, poorly labeled, poorly titled, undifferentiated information that you dump into some place, most software, I would say, dare say almost all software, it's not going to be able to fix that for you. You need to do some level of organization uh, from the front if you want that to be usable in a practical way. And really, if you have a shiny new system you're launching, you really don't want to muck it up with a bunch of junk anyways. So remember, they can't do the job for you if you don't give it a head start. Um, so why do we worry so much about access? Well, it's because these days we deal with a lot of public records requests. And this is a critical component of any information system that's going to contain records because you know at some point you're going to get somebody asking to see stuff in it. Even if, for example, your team only accesses information in a short period of time and then a lot of it just sits there, or we only ever search by these tracking numbers, we don't really do searches on other subjects or things like that, yes, but might you have to do one of those searches later on? Entirely possible. So you might get a sub-public information request that says, I want to see you know, every transaction relating to such and such organization and these individuals between these time ranges. So you better answer, ask that question before you purchase something. Will I be able to construct a search like that? Because if you can't, that means that's going to be manual browsing work. You're going to have to do a bl blunt search and then dig, which takes a lot of time and it takes money. So these are things you want to make sure you are covering beforehand. These questions uh, may be uncomfortable at times, because, and I will tell you right now that a software vendor will often, even the reputable ones, I'm not trying to bag on them, but they will try to glide over things that they don't think you need or that their system can't do. Um, so it behooves you to answer, ask the question, the hard questions, uh, and not every software system has to be able to do everything, but you need a way to do it. So if you don't have another mechanism that will allow you to do these searches, um, you need the software to, because I can tell you right now, uh, manual uh, digging through is not a practical solution long term. So that is something you really want to be asking up front. So having identified that we're going to be storing some records in there and that we're going to need to access them somehow, the next big question is how are we going to secure these records? So we know as public entities that a vast majority of what we do is public. However, not every component of every record is public uh, right away, and not to everyone. So we may deal with sensitive information. We know this when we deal with employee files. You may have background check information. You may have social security numbers. You may have financial information. You have, may have medical records. If you deal with students, you may have, of course, student records which are protected. Um, all of these things, if you deal with any sort of law enforcement, of course, there's lots of protected information in there. <laughs> so you need to be concerned about securing that information to make sure that people that aren't supposed to see it don't accidentally see it. And for even records that aren't super high restriction, you may have reasons that you want to restrict certain types of records internally from other groups. For example, HR records probably shouldn't be viewable by the entire agency. You probably shouldn't be able to have somebody go and accidentally look up their own files or somebody else's. So you need to be able to apply security. So part of the questions we ask is who would be able to add records to this sort of system? Who would be able to modify those records and who can delete the content? So that might deal with logins and user access. It might deal with internal controls and security groups. Um, we need to make sure that you have rules in there to protect the records from unauthorized uh, alteration and especially with the authenticity of records. And by authenticity in this case, I mean that they are what they purport to be, uh, that they reflect an accurate accounting of what they are supposed to. So. You want to make sure there's never a question about whether or not something is real because it wasn't well managed. So, for example, if I take 
uh, if I take a a a timesheet, sure a timesheet. That's not a sensitive record particularly, but let's just take a timesheet. Um, and I have it within a system that requires a login that only certain employees can get into. The system tracks that information and records it in the database and there's lots of information surrounding it to say this information was here and this is how long it's been here. Shows when it was added and deleted, etc. If I take that same timesheet and I say print it out into a PDF or actually into a piece of paper for that matter and then just shove it somewhere, stick it on a drive somewhere or a, a file cabinet that's uncontrolled, that you know just somewhere or in my desk, do we really trust that record? Somebody asks to see it later on, you hand over that record and they say, okay, well, do we have any information about how it was kept? Do we know that this thing was secure the whole time it was kept? Who had their hands on it? You know, it's kind of the idea of an email that appears out of nowhere with no provenance, with no, you know, paper trail, so to speak, behind it, no people involved. Uh, raises some questions about whether or not that is in fact what it's purporting to be. So this is important for us to, to show the authenticity. So we talk about, we really want rules in place that, that protect these records for that. Um, and we want to be able to apply different levels of access. Um, now, if this is a fairly limited software system, like for example, it's all it's doing is payroll, you may only have three people that have access to it. So in that case, you may not need different levels for all those folks. But if this is software that has more, you know, more complexity to it, you want to find out if you can apply different levels, security groups, so to speak. And then who's responsible for, for maintaining the security and applying it? Uh, is it you, as in the department implementing it? Is it your internal IT support? Do you have outside consultants or other folks that will be responsible for this? These are other questions that are important. So if you're contracting with a vendor, are they the ones handling this? Who, who's ultimately in charge of the security parameters? Who has access to them? And who is, re is responsible if there is a problem with them? So we've dealt with uh, we've dealt with storing, we've dealt with accessing, we've dealt with securing. So the next big thing, preserving. So this is my my fancy graphic I've created for uh, record preserves. Um, not included is the day and a half worth of sweaty backbreaking labor required to jar said records. Um, anybody that's uh, made applesauce or or jarred soup understands what I'm talking about. Um, so. Preserving our records is something that uh, may not be necessarily critical for all records. So I mentioned earlier, if you've got six-year records, preservation is not your top priority. You know, they can live for six years pretty much anywhere, and they'll be relatively safe. Um, but we have lots of records that have to be kept for decades or more, many decades. Some of them are permanent. We do have to think about preser preserving these over time. Um, so any file is only as good as the system surrounding it. So, for example, I could take a file that is pristine, um, you know, in every other way, but it was written in WordStar in 1992. Uh, that file may not have been altered. It may not have been corrupted or damaged in any way. But do you have software that can even interpret that in any re real way anymore? Probably not. It would take a long, a long chain of digging through software to find something that could read something that you could do, you know, and you'd probably lose information along the way. That's an example of file obsolescence, file format obsolescence. So this is something we have to monitor over time. The same goes for physical storage. So whenever people talk about, well, we've got a disk that'll last for three decades, well, that's great, but you aren't going to have anything to read that disk on, so that's not really the issue. We need to make sure nothing sits on the same for, you know, the same media forever, and so it's all about keeping and managing it uh, over time. Specifically speaking about files, since we're talking about software systems here, we do need to make sure if we have to keep things for many decades, that we are have a way to monitor these files for uh, for impending obsolescence. So we need to know, for example, uh, yeah, it looks like Microsoft's withdrawing support for that file format. Do we have anything in that format so we can identify it, convert it over what's called migration, uh, migrate it to a new format so it remains usable? Um, because just having a record, I'm presenting, you know, if you, if you have a record that's subject to a records request in 30 years, but it's in a format that nobody can read anymore, and you hand that over, you can bet they're going to argue about that. That's not, you know, that's not in keeping with the law. You need to make sure you can actually read these things. Um, we need to show consistent management of records over time for public trust. So this goes along with that authenticity argument I mentioned. You want to show unbroken custody. You want to show that this thing has been controlled through its whole life and doesn't have some big gray area for a decade in the middle where it was somewhere. Um, that you know can create some pretty significant questions about how you're managing your records and can definitely damage public trust. Um, so 
speaking about, since we're talking about systems that may maintain these records, so within these systems, we need to ask the question, can we identify the file types? Does it allow us to identify file types and convert them when needed? Do they maintain them entirely within some sort of proprietary database? Can we act, can we uh, you know can we work with that, or does it maintain them as discrete files that we put in, like Word documents or PDFs? Uh, and can we you know are we able to convert those within the system, or do we have to do something external to it? I can tell you right now that in most systems, you would need to export them and move them to something else. But uh, so long as you identify that mechanism and know if you can take a thorough accounting of what you have, that's usually okay. So, at some point, for most of these long-term records, we're going to need to export them. In many cases, our records are going to outlive the systems in which they currently reside. Um, so these, these many decade, our, our PERS benefits records, uh, retirement sort of fun stuff, um, you know, long-term employee records, employee files are maintained for the time they're there, plus 75 years. I mean, it's a long time. Uh, if you deal with student files, similarly, you know, long-time records. So, so if it contains long-term records, it's very unlikely it will maintain them forever. The software is going to get old faster than the records do. Um, so, you know, an example with this, how many systems do you have from 20 years ago that you're still using? I mean, many of us still have one or two maybe lurking around, but they're largely sunsetted. They're, they're really not used much anymore. In fact, and I'll get to this example in the next bit, sometimes we're keeping them afloat just because they have records in them. So um, we need to think about how we're going to get records out, especially when we're looking at procuring new software. If you do not have the ability to export records, I would not purchase any software, honestly. Um, that's a basic function that anybody should be able to do. You need to be able to pull stuff out in a usable, readable format. Um, you need to think about those who will take over after you retire or leave this job. Because in some cases, we won't see the folks doing this work right now are not going to be the ones hurt if we don't do a good job right now. It's going to be the people that have to do this job down the line. And we really don't want to leave them a mess. So think about if you were walking into a job and it was handed off to you, and I think many of us probably have examples of this, where we stepped into a job where somebody had had it for a long time but had not maintained it, the, the, the data well or the information well, had not organized things well. Um, there was a lot of knowledge that disappeared with them. So we need to think about can the next person get this stuff out without me being there to intermediate? Um, I don't know why this slide keeps doing this to me. It shouldn't uh, uh, do the spacing like this. Hang on, let me see if I can. Let's try this again. Yep. There we go, that's better. Okay, so we don't chop off our text here. Um, so. When we need to export these records, will we be able to, another question to ask, will we be able to, for example, uh, extract information surrounding the records or just the records themselves? Because uh, as records live in a system, as I've noted, uh, you know, they build up information. You've added notes. You've added contextual information to them over time. You don't want to lose all of that when you export it. So can you get that metadata? Facts sometimes can limit uh, contracts can limit who owns certain aspects of the uh, the items and the metadata within them. So that's something to be very careful about when you're signing contracts with external vendors, whether they're providing storage support uh, or other types of support, uh, making sure you have clear ownership of all of the data you put in there and it is not uh, restricted from you in any way. Um, you need to think about also that in many cases, if you have software and you maintain it for a long time, the software developer may not be around in the future. So you may not be able to count on them for direct support, and you don't want to be playing that game. So uh, definitely want to think about being able to export those records before uh, that situation arises. Um, generally speaking, you want to plan for migration about every 10 years as a benchmark. Now, that does not mean every single record is going to need to be converted to a new format every 10 years. But that is a rough benchmark based upon how progress tends to go in terms of file formats and when they, when they take over from others and the general average life of, of software systems. So if you aim for 10-year benchmark, maybe it ends up being 8 years. Maybe it ends up being 15. Uh, but uh, that's generally what you should be planning for uh, with, in terms of being able to pull records out uh, for storage in another environment. Um, certainly in an active system, Usually, there's not a compelling reason to maintain records, long-term records in that system for more than that 10 years or so. They're unlikely to be active anymore, and they really are probably better served in a more stable storage environment. So I think the last aspect, I think, if I remember my slides correctly, the last aspect I talk about when looking at new software systems 
is the ability to uh, plan for records destruction. Records, <laughs> as I read my slide here, need to plan for regular records destruction destruction. Oops. <laughs> I'm doing a little live editing here. See, you seeing what I'm seeing here? It did not show up when I blew it up, but then it did. Now it's fine. Weird. <laughs> I hope you guys are seeing what I'm seeing here, and I'm not just talking about crazy. Um, anyways, so we want to we need to plan for regular records destruction uh, because otherwise uh, we're just keeping things forever, and that's a not in, not in keeping with with public records law. You know, we we do need to be destroying records when they are supposed to be destroyed, uh, but also it's just bad business practice. It opens you up to all sorts of possible li you know legal liability. Um, it costs a lot of money to over retain records over time, so we do need to plan for this. Non permanent records will all eventually be destroyed. Does the system you're using, or excuse me, in this case, does the system you're looking at procuring, looking at using? allow you to do destruction of specific records. And I don't mean wiping the whole database. I mean selectively saying this batch of records needs to go away while these are still there. Um, this can be very challenging, particularly when we're talking about interrelated databases. This may not be a possibility in all types of system, which is a valid answer. It's not ideal, but it's something we need to contend with. So if you have a lot of complex databases linking together, the records might not exist as, as independent discrete files. They may all kind of share information, which makes it a lot more challenging to selectively purge data out of that system. Um, so if you, the system does allow destruction of specific records, can it destroy them in bulk? So could you say, this fi these 5,000 records I've identified, please destroy now? Or do you have to manually go in and delete them out of the system one at a time, which is not a practical option? So this is something to ask. Do we have the ability to identify this stuff um, when we, you know, maybe the system doesn't track retention. Most systems won't unless they are a records management system. Um, but can you at least say if you know these are six-year records, um, do you have the ability to go in there and say everything that is more than six years old um, we're going to purge, even if the system didn't tell you that, you know. So uh, can you do that in bulk, or do you have to do it one at a time? Because if it's one at a time, that's not a practical solution. Uh, and so I really would be, I'd be wary about that if you can, do not have the ability to go and manage records in bulk. Um, if the system can do deletion based upon rules you've established, does it automate that deletion? Uh, and it, does it give you reports for auditing purposes? Um, is there a human oversight in the process? So I am leery also of any sort of automated destruction. You do want human review, even if it's just to say, look at the thing, look at the right, read out the report and say, yep, that looks good, go ahead and proceed. That's great. But you really don't want a system that's going to just, you know, you set a rule and it just churns them, purges them automatically uh, without some oversight because there's always a possibility of people have made mistakes, they've misfiled things, they put stuff in the wrong place, they've mislabeled something. You want a second review on that because once those records are gone, they're gone. Uh, and you don't want to be playing that game. Um, over retention of records certainly, like I mentioned, is problematic. It can be costly and open you up to a lot of liability. But under retention of records it can have much more dramatic short-term effects as well. So you want to make sure you are, are definitely making sure you're erring on the side of caution there. Um, and not letting a system just purge. And for this, I don't necessarily mean automatic purging of backups or, you know, certain systems will recycle after a certain period of time. Um, I'm speaking more about if you have the main primary records and you are purging the primary copies from the system, not the, not the redundant backups that are run regularly. Any questions about this section? I know we're moving kind of briskly along here. Uh, the slides are, are slash will be available um, to folks. I think I've, I don't recall if I've posted these on our website. If not, I will be sharing this with everybody that's registered here. I'll be sending a copy so you can review later. Um, but any questions uh, surrounding the, the procurement of new systems? I know this is pretty broad uh, in its uh, definition before we move on. Hearing none? Okay. So next question, or excuse me, next section, dealing with existing information systems. So this is where we get into some of the harder points where we don't always have perfect solutions. So the first section deals with, you know, in an ideal world, we make these decisions before we buy something, before we build something, so we can do exactly what we want to do and make sure it covers our needs. Uh, however, um, in when we were dealing with existing software that we have inherited from somebody else that was developed years ago in some cases or was purchased out of the box uh, by somebody else for different reasons, 
Um, we got to deal with what we've got, in which case we may not have a perfect array of options. We may have to do a little bit of, uh, of compromise. So I've got this system, uh, is, is the phrase we run across here. So legacy systems, as they're referred to in general, older systems uh, carried over from previous groups, often present all sorts of records management challenges. So we lack, in many cases, contextual metadata. What I mean by this is that we may have a system that contains records with almost no information surrounding them about where they came from, when they were put in, when they're how long they're supposed to be kept, what their security risks are, all these things. You may just have data with no rules applied to it. Um, very difficult to reconstruct later on. Um, you're very likely to have intermingled record and non-record content. You're going to have a mishmash of all sorts of things. Typically, a lot of these old systems have very poor or no export functionality. They, this, the records may, in fact, be locked up within the software. Um, you often will find software layers between you and the records. So the only way to access these records is to go through the software. And if you were to somehow extract the, the content from the system, it would be unreadable without that software to read it. So very proprietary sort of arrangements, which we run across, particularly in older systems. You may run across records that exist only virtually. And by that is, is referring back to my previous example of the, uh, the relational database model where instead of, say, a PDF and a PDF and a PDF sitting there, basically, you have a large table, many tables of data elements containing names and addresses and uh, employee numbers and salary history or whatever. I'm just throwing out different data points. That, when you ask the system to show me John Doe's uh, employee record, it's going to query and pull all of the things that are tied to him from all those different tables and present something to me that looks like a record. But they don't actually exist until you ask for them. So they're all intermingled in the system, creating a real headache for managing them. Um, retention in older systems is almost never considered. Uh, these systems, in many cases, were designed without a real exit plan. They're just a bunch of stuff in there for as long as you want to keep it in there, but never really a plan. And, and a shocking amount of software these days still is designed with the idea that you can just cram stuff in there forever. Um, this is sort of the Googleization of the world. You know, the idea is that you can just store everything. You know, they, we we have a, a popular mindset that you can just cram more and more storage and it's cheap. Well, for a massive conglomerate, yeah, it's cheap to store tons of data, especially when you're, you know, mining it for your own purposes. Uh, but for those of us that do not have limitless resources and endless amounts of storage and computer power to throw at it, um, it is not ideal uh, to just maintain ever-growing piles of stuff. So we need to do a little hard triage here. We're going to have to make some tough decisions. We're going to have to make some bulk rules based upon the best thing we can do. And we're all going to acknowledge that it's not going to be perfect and it's okay. Um, nobody is blameless here. Nobody is, uh, but nobody is super guilty. We're just all, we kind of all stumbled into this on ourselves. We're, we're doing the best we can. So first of all, we have to ask some questions. How much life is left in the system we're looking at? If this is software that was built five years ago or purchased five years ago, probably quite a bit of life left and it may actually be pretty easy to use. If this is, however, a custom-built database that was handcrafted in 1997 and has been intermittently updated ever since, but nobody's done anything to it since 2012, uh, we are in for some pain because there's not much life left in that system. It's probably well past its original withdrawal date, um, and we need to think hard about it. Um, what records are stored in the system? Of course, just like on the first section, we need to think about what's going to be in there because, again, if these are short-term records, it's much less of an issue than if these are long-term records. Then we ask ourselves, is the life of the records remaining in the system longer than the remaining life of the system? So system is due to withdraw in two years. What are the records in there? If we've got anything more than two-year records from this point forward, we got a problem. So you can see this is in most cases going to be the situation where the records are going to outlive the system at some point. And then, is there an export function? Next question. And how complete is it? So is this, again, going to give you uh, a pile of fi files with no context? I've seen some people that, you know, we when we created the content, it went into the system. It assigned the records a name associated with an internal table that when you extract the records, there's it means nothing. It's just a string of random digits, and there's no other information on the files. That is not helpful. So uh, that's what we have to look at. Can we export? How can we export? Is it usable? You know, what do we need to do uh, to get this usable? Uh, next thing to do is, of course, look at our, our, our legal compliance. Um, consult again those OAR 166 Division 17 rules regarding electronic records management. 
um, are we allowed, are we legally allowed to maintain records in the system long term? So say you've still got life left in the system. It could be, however, that you've got some very long-term records, 100-year or more records, that you legally cannot maintain in there long-term. You need to pull them out. Um, furthermore, are the records kept in an acceptable file format? Because there are standards for that as well for long-term storage of records. So that's something in those rules to look at because, um, yes, while records that exist only virtually in a relatively short to medium term period, that's acceptable. At some point, they need to be exported into a wait, static wait, format I... that can be uh, maintained. Do I have a question? No? OK. Uh, sorry, I heard a little voice. Um, so are we able to get these into acceptable format uh, at some point? Um, State agencies, so I know I probably have a mishmash of state and local and county and everything else in this uh, session here. State agencies are legally required to destroy records at their full retention period. So for state agencies, the retention schedule is a minimum and a maximum time period. Now, there is some wiggle room in there because, of course, nobody is doing daily destructions as records expire on a daily basis. Typically, people do this on an annual basis. So that means, yes, you're, retain you're over-retaining some records for about a year. You know, a January 1st record, uh, you know, might be over-retained by a full year before you actually get around destroying it. And there may be other uh, situations where, because of technology limitations, you can't do purges more frequently than, you, than, than a certain amount. Or, in order to handle things, you're dealing with them in bulk, and so you're going to over-retain some, but there is still a terminal date. The key point, so there's wiggle room there, but the key point here is that you do not have things just forever. There, there will be an endpoint. For those of you at local or other types of entities besides state entities, um, your retention periods are a minimum. However, I, I really want everybody to follow the same spirit of the rule, even if it's not a hard requirement for you, uh, because it is foolhardy to just plan to just keep it all forever, as I think I've mentioned a bunch of times, and I probably will a little bit more. So we have a, few, a couple scenarios here. Now remember, our scenario is we're dealing with old system records uh, that maybe have to be kept for longer. Um, so scenario number one, not our ideal choice, but one we might find ourselves in. First of all, records are either short term, so there's not really an issue, or there's significant barriers to exporting them. So this is a proprietary system that was never built with an export function. It would, you know, the developers are long gone. We don't have a budget for it anymore. The software company went out of business. Literally, there's no one to help us get this stuff out. They're trapped. Okay, uh, can we purge from the system selectively? Great. If you can delete the records from the system as appropriate until eventually there's nothing left. You can just sort of purge them through so you limit, limit your liability over time. Um, when the system uh, reaches end of life, uh, you need, you're need you going to have to keep it in a float in the background until all, all of the contents of that system are at full retention. That's not a pretty scenario, but it is one I've seen happen in plenty of places where you have a legacy system that nobody really gets into anymore except for the rare occasions when you need that data running on one older server with maybe one workstation connected to it. Um, the idea that it's there and you're, you know, okay, well, we've got 20 more years of retention and records in those things even though we aren't using that software anymore. So that thing's going to have to be kept afloat for 20 years to meet that retention period because just turning it off and killing all those records is not an acceptable alternative. So if there's truly no way to get the records out, this is what you get stuck with. Uh, so you can see why that research in the first section becomes important so we don't do that to ourselves going forward. But we deal with what we deal with right now. Scenario number two, this is the preferred one. Um, so again, records have significant retention or they will outlive the system. So in this context, uh, maybe they only have to be kept for six or seven more years, but the system is dead today. Like we need to get rid of it. So we're going to have to export it anyways. Or, or they're going to be kept for many decades and regardless of the system we're in, we're going to have to export them. Um, so you want to identify the logical export point in the system. So if this is still an actively used system, for example, um, at what point in the record life cycle does it make sense to pull these things out? At what point have we fulfilled their active use, put the data in, use them for what we're going to use them for? We don't really need these records in that active system anymore. We can move them into a semi-active or inactive state for the remainder of their retention period. Um, so we're going to stick them in a place where they'll be safe. We can get to them if we need to, but we don't need them gumming up the active system anymore. Uh, so we need to identify the logical export point uh, 
then we need to go ahead and pull out the records and the metadata surrounding them when at all possible. So again, we don't have undifferentiated junk. Now, if the records are fairly self-descriptive, they have a good title naming convention, you can export them and put them into directories that make sense. Maybe a ton of metadata isn't necessary, but you do need to be aware of the retention periods, for example, or the security requirements, which would be counting as metadata as well. So whether that information is coming from the system you're pulling it out of or you're able to pull it from somewhere else, you need to make sure that's accounted for. Um, you also need to decide whether you're going to duplicate the data so that you have a ready access copy in the active system and then the main definitive record copy for storage, or if you're going to move them entirely when they hit that semi-active point. That is going to be a practical consideration for you. Generally speaking, I advise against a lot of duplication of records because that increases the risk of, hey, we did a purge on the records in the official copy, but turns out we forgot about all the copies we have in the active system still, so those records aren't actually gone. So we didn't actually destroy records. So I really encourage generally um, move rather than duplicate data. Um, if there is a need for having that data in the original system for a little bit longer, fine, but identify a point in which you will no longer want it. So if, for example, at five years, we move the records, we move a copy of the records to the storage system, we maintain a copy in the main active system for another three years as they are semi-active and we might need to get into them a little more. At the end of that three years, we purge from the active system and then we only have them in the old system. That would be an example of that. What we don't want to have happen is a scenario where we move a copy over to the old system and then maintain the other copy in the system forever uh, or until that system goes down because then again, we're not executing good records management. We still need to consider access needs, of course, in these older systems. So does the system accommodate ready search and retrieval? Did I actually? There we go. Um, does it accommodate, uh, excuse me, accommodate that, or would it be better served somewhere else? So again, this might be the system itself may have life left in it, but it's lousy to access data, so you may want to move records out sooner rather than later. Um, What's the active versus the inactive life of the record? So this goes into that calculation. Um, so active life being when you're actively using it on a daily basis, maybe you're still adding to it, maybe you're still accessing it. Um, you know, current fiscal year financial records are an example. You know, we access them heavily in one year and then largely we keep them for, for tax purposes, for legal requirements, um, but we're not accessing them nearly as much in, you know, years two through, two through six than we are in year one. Um, do you have an alternative search method elsewhere? So again, um, can you do a search somewhere else that will help you retrieve these records or do you need that active system to do the search for you? Um, so that's another thing you'll have to think about when you're planning the strategy for how we're going to maintain these things over time. So what do we do with our exported records? So say we've got our scenario number two, we've pulled the records out, excellent. Um, if we have records of greater, uh, sorry, of, of 100 years or more, they must be stored in a physical format or in an approved electronic records management system. So this is in those Division 17 rules. Um, it used to be you just had to maintain them in a physical format, that being microfilm or paper, and that was the way it was, or, or fi you know, film if it's an audio, you know, a physical medium of some sort, uh, video sort of stuff. Um, not the case anymore. You have an out, but for those records, you have to maintain them. If you're going to maintain them digitally, they must be maintained in an, in an electronic records management system that meets the Division 17 rules. And part of that is there's a petition process that gets sent to the archives um, to make sure that you are in an approved ERMS before you are allowed to uh, before you are allowed to store them solely in that in that scenario. Um, with records of less than 100 years. The agency has a choice. They can frankly do whatever they want. They are promising to provide access to their records for their entire retention period, um, but we leave the methods up to them. Now, that said, it is very risky. Uh, it is very risky if they do not maintain them in some sort of proper records management system. Um, without a system of management, and I'm using this as a generic term now, a system of management being either software that does this for you, doing the maintenance, uh, the checking for obsolescence, the applying security and providing access, or, or software does that for you, or you have a, a sequence of duties and responsibilities and training that accomp accomplish this to some extent as well. Um, without that in place, uh, you're really taking a big risk because uh, it's highly unlikely these records will survive for the time they're necessary. So if if these are, again, 10-year records, you're probably okay. 
but if you have to keep these for 50 or 60 or 75 years, you better be treating them as if they were permanent. We made the hard requirement 100 year or more, but that's just because we needed a clean breaking point and that made sense where we you know, wanted to exert more authority. But if you have a 75 year record, that's essentially permanent for our purposes, for your purposes, what I mean. And, you know, you're going to have to keep it beyond anybody that's working there now and possibly beyond the people that are going to take over for you. You know, we're looking at a couple generations worth of workers, so to speak. So uh, the risks are the same and we're going to need to deal with them that way. So I've mentioned this a couple times. I'd like to introduce the concept of an electronic records management system to you for those that may not be familiar. Um, for this long-term back-end storage. Um, an electronic records management system is a, this is not the dictionary definition. You will find very complicated definitions elsewhere, um, but that's not my goal here. It is a software system that allows for comprehensive manage, management of records. Um, it will allow you to organize your records, search for them, access them in various ways, apply security to, retention, uh, rules to and dispose of those that are not permanent records all within the software. Um, it can help you automate a lot of routine tasks, taking away the human element whenever possible. Um, it does These sort of systems can ensure accountability by applying uh, security rules, applying audit trails to everything. So the idea is that content that goes in there is tracked and managed. Nothing happens to it without there being a record of it. So again, there's our, our public trust. We always know what happened and when. Here in Oregon, that requirement for these things is it must meet the Department of Defense standard listed there, 5015.2. Um, it has to be in a system like that. Um, I do have a list of those systems, and I will include a link to it in the email I send you afterwards. Um, because if you are not in one of those systems, that is not approved uh, per our state uh, law. Um, there are not an infinite number of systems that meet that qualification. There are probably a dozen or, a dozen or so different software systems currently in existence that meet that. Um, we also, of course, have the Oregon Records Management Solution here in Oregon, which is a, a really unique project that I'm pretty proud of being a part of. That's not the purpose of talking about here, but if you have questions about this, basically it's a facilitated solution where you don't have to do this on your own. We at the Archives partner with you and help you do it, um, running it software as a service style. Um, so we help provide the software for you uh, and you pay a subscription fee essentially instead of fronting it all. If you have questions about that, please, I am the person to ask about that. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about that in a different situation. We can arrange another demo, that sort of thing. But uh, nonetheless, whatever system you're looking at, you need to make sure that it co covers your needs um, because for these long-term records, there's really no way to do this manually. You really have to have software to help you do it. Um, so last little bit here, uh, I know this is a lot of information. Um, generally speaking, what I want to imp imp imprint on people here is that we have to constantly be on the look and adapting to new technologies. None of us has all of the answers. So um, we don't know what we're going to be using in a decade. I don't know what we're going to be using in a decade. Um, you know, some things will be the same or very similar and some things might be radically different. We see the pace of technology change uh, increase all the time. And while those of us in government certainly aren't always seeing the latest and greatest the second it comes out, um, nonetheless, um, we do have to adapt. So regardless of the sort of software I'm talking about right now or the specific standards I'm referencing right now, um, you know, a lot of this is just about, about keeping our eye to the future on this. Um, and I always want to make sure that everybody is asking, what about the records? It's the title of the presentation. What about the records? When when we're looking at technology, when we're looking at information systems, because everything we adopt, whether it's a new uh, social media platform, whether it's mobile technology, whether it's old school databases or other sort of internal software, most of the things we touch are going to at some point touch records, whether it's creating records or passing through the, the system. Uh, and as, as such, we need to think about those things as early as possible in the process because it's very much a lot easier, as you've hopefully seen in the slides I've shown you, much easier to deal with things before you're in the thick of it than it is to try to, to do that triage, to retrofit stuff later on. Um, that's a lot more appropriate, um, a lot more important. Um, and just because a new technology seems really cool and you think it might have some utility does not mean that every aspect is going to be appropriate for the government context. I don't like being a naysayer about new technologies. Um, I work with them all the time. But, you know, in our own agency, we've had to have times when we've had folks come in and say, hey, what about this thing? This is really exciting. We could use this to communicate this and that. And we have to look at it hard and go, you know what, there's really no way for us to effectively control the content in that. There's no effective way for us to capture records from that. It's really too big of a risk. It's not appropriate 
for our usage. Or we have to say, this software can do these seven things, but only five of them are actually appropriate for us. Two of those are a little too far out there for us to, to manage appropriately. And maybe that'll change. We hope so. We hope new tools will become available to help us deal with those. But um, you know, we can't just go about you know, doing whatever we want just because it seems neat. Um, as always, plan for creation, capture, and retention before you're already in the thick of it. The, question, the time to answer these questions is before something is purchased, before something's built, and not afterwards. So um, my little visual example there at the bottom here is sort of the progression of, of written media types, so to speak. So, you know, and, and we see the cycle increasing ever, ever, you know, more and more rapidly. So we go from cuneiform tablets and papyrus, uh, which were around for thousands of years, paper, which we've been using for a couple thousand years, uh, digital documents, which we've been using for a few decades, uh, and then who knows what the next thing is, but it's, it's shortening ever, ever more, you know, so we're looking at more and more dynamic technologies that create more hassles this way. And our conception of what, you know, con it comprises a discrete record keeps shifting. So stay tuned. We're going to stay communicating with folks about this. Um, you know, we continue to look at it, and we will revise over time. So you know, this this presentation may not look exactly the same in another couple of years, uh, but uh, we always want to be be talking about it. Any questions? You can type them in the chat box if you'd like. I'm keeping an eye on that right now. If you'd like to chime in via audio, I'm I'm all ears. So the question, uh, are there handouts or reference tools? Well, I mentioned I'll be sending the slides to you. I will also send you a list of, uh, I'm going, yes, I, so I will be emailing a list, uh, a, a slides out to everybody that was on the registered list, um, as well as a, the, um, the link to those uh, DOD certified systems. Um, and uh, anything else I can think of when I'm putting it together. I've got a couple other things sometimes I'll throw at people. Um, I'll also put a, a link to our archives uh, records management site where we update, um, where we update, uh, ref, you know, update resources as we create them and things like that. So, um, yeah, am I the contact for help with respect to applying these concepts and suggestions to a particular software system? I'm as good as anyone. Um, so, you know, you can contact me since I'm the one talking here, um, and I'd be happy to advise. I mean, I'm not the definitive expert on all software, but I'd be happy to to help talk through your scenario, or your particular case, and maybe uh, help you come up with some solutions, sure. Um, got a question here about purchasing certified systems, helping us implement. So um, there is a list of, of DOD certified systems. Um, if you choose to work through us with the Oregon Records Management Solution, um, with that, we provide hands-on help and assistance, and we'll help you build the system, we'll help you plan stuff out, we give you training and everything else. If you choose to use software externally, we can't really do that for you. Um, I'd be happy we can give you advice as to sort of things you should be looking at, um, but we, we can't go out there and we don't know all those software. You know, we don't have the expertise necessary to help you build them and, and implement them that same way. Um, but we're always happy to dispense advice from that from that aspect. Uh, what about retention of historical documents? Um, I'm not sure I quite get your context here. If you're referring to uh, permanent records. I mean, if we're talking historical as in permanent archival records, those fall under those Division 17 rules. They, you are allowed to maintain them in a digi digitally, uh, digital format only, so long as they are within one of those DOD certified systems. Um, so that's the, that's the exception there. If not, if you do not have a DOD certified system to maintain them within, they have to be kept within a, with a, a physical format of some sort, whether that's microfilm or paper. Um, if you have other questions surrounding those, uh, you can, you, if you elaborate or send me a follow-up, I mean, if I'm not sure what else we go along with that. And yes, everybody will get a, a grab bag of various links and such afterwards, including the list.
All right, I'll stick around for another moment or so if there's any more questions. Otherwise, I really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, hope you all have a great, great holidays. Enjoy some time with your family, friends, etc. And, uh, you know, take a few days and don't think about this stuff. Thanks for coming. <laughs>